<laughs> um, so uh, for those folks who don't know, um, for those folks who don't know uh, what this talk is, uh, this talk was originally something that I tried to give at uh, Closure Conch in the U.S. So I would offered it up as um, an analog between Vipassana meditation and uh, Closure as a programming language. Uh, that was rejected three times. Um, then I changed it up to be uh, Vipassana for Lisp programmers, which was a talk that I submitted to Strangely in St. Louis. Uh, that talk was also rejected. Um, and I've sort of broadened or narrowed, depending on how you look at it, um, Vipassana for uh, closure developers to Vipassana for list programmers to Vipassana for hackers generally. Um, and I've kind of widened the definition of hackers as well. Um, does anybody not know me? Sorry, I, like, I don't know a few of the phases, but most of you I actually know. Um, so I'll kind of skip the introduction because I don't really think that that's necessary with this craft. But I wasn't sure who was actually going to be coming. Um, so this talk is a little strangely structured. Um, it is about 70% introduction to the talk itself, um, which is a little bit like Vipassana actually, and that is very self-referential. Um, so the reason that we need to do this is to kind of get through all the things that we won't be talking about in the course of this talk. Um, so we're going to start out with uh, discussing an episode of Radio Lab that I heard after my last Vipassana course that I think is really relevant. Um, and this episode is called Where Am I? You can look it up and hear it online for free as a podcast. Um, and it's basically a bunch of small explorations of uh, consciousness and speaking to neuroscientists and pe speaking to people with very peculiar uh, neurological diseases and trying to um, piece together exactly what is consciousness from kind of a scientific perspective. Um, and so the way that they introduced this episode is uh, with a conversation about how your body is effectively deceiving your mind almost continuously. Um, and so you can kind of look at this as an extension of the deception of reality. So if you're looking at something, uh, the light traveling into your eye is not actually get reaching your eye um, and telling you about the thing that you're seeing. So if you're looking into space, you're seeing years into the past. If you're looking at this, you're seeing just a split moment or two into the past, but you're not actually seeing something that's actually there. Um, and then they go into uh, the history of um, neuroscience to a degree uh, with some psychologists, and particularly uh, William James. So William James proposed um, in the early 20th century, this idea that um, your consciousness and your intellect is rooted in your body and that people who were paralyzed would not feel uh, emotions the way that people who are able-bodied would. Um, he was essentially laughed out of his discipline uh, around 1900. Um, and... Uh, what they've come to realize, the scientific community, is that this is actually true. Um, so there's this whole notion of visual imagery reaching your visual cortex and being processed by your brain. Um, but what's, what's occurred in the past 30 or 40 years is we've realized that what we used to know about sound very clearly and very like physically, so if you hear a loud explosion on Diwali, for example, your body jumps before you actually cognize the fact that you've heard an explosion. Uh, so that is your ear sending signals directly into your nervous system, and your nervous system is jumping without your brain actually really being aware. Um, they found that this is true for all the senses. So all the senses send signals into your body, and they're processed by your nervous system almost in parallel, but also faster than your brain is processing those signals. Um, and so the example in the Radio Lab episode is that uh, if you show up at your friend Tommy's house, and your friend Tommy is dead and he's lying on the ground, um, that you'll see his dead body and your body will start to react by your heartbeat getting faster and you'll start sweating and things before you actually realize that your friend Tony is dead. Um, so there are uh, these new studies which essentially um, corroborate what William James had proposed. 
um, which is uh, going to people who were previously able-bodied and are now paralyzed to varying degrees and asking them how they feel emotionally um, and how they feel as a person. And people who are quadriplegics um, generally feel like less of a person. So not just physically, but emotionally and intellectually, they feel like they've lost some part of themselves. Um, and so one of the neuroscientists that they have on this episode uh, says that our being is rooted in a body state, uh, and that you were, if you were able, able to remove your brain from your body, you wouldn't know who you were. Um, and this is kind of like scientifically rooted idea, um, which essentially eliminates um, the uh, Futurama notion of keeping heads of famous people from the past in glass jars and not having bodies attached to them, and they could still talk and think. Uh, they wouldn't know who they are anymore. Um, and so toward the end of the episode, they have a little skit between one of the people from Radiolab and his wife, where they have a pretend fight uh, during the podcast. And it ends with this um, concept of the autonomic nervous system governing our own anger. Um, and so between the two of them, uh, they discuss the fact that it's been researched that men's autonomic nervous system um, has a half-life which is about half of that of women's. So the imbalance that occurs um, in relationships between men and women when they're having fights and getting upset with one another is actually physiologically rooted. So um, men will recover within the scope of the autonomic nervous system more quickly, and women will hold on to the physical state of their emotion for longer. Um, an interesting uptick of this is that women seem to be better at dealing with their emotions in a Vipassana course. <laughs> So if you watch, um, the Vipassana courses are split into men and women, they're segregated by side. And if you watch the women's side, they're very calm and they're always on time and everyone's sitting properly. And the men's side is like a kindergarten class, like everyone's running around and upset and people are crying. The men are crying, the women are not crying. Um, and so the last thing that they cover is actually a singular case of a fellow who lost his proprioception. Um, so your proprioception is the sense uh, of where your body physically is in space. Um, so you know intuitively uh, where all your limbs are, where your head is all the time. And that's what allows you to walk. So that's why a newborn baby can't walk. They have to learn proprioception as a sense. Um, and he lost this. So he actually had to learn to walk again, but um, visually and through other cues. So he would literally watch his legs and watch when they're hitting the ground so that he could tell, oh, okay, I'm taking a step now, because his leg wasn't sending any signals back to his brain. He could control his legs, so he could manage this, but he had to man manage it intellectually rather than uh, through the proprioception sense. Um, so I recommend that everybody go and listen to that Radio Lab episode because I think it actually helps ground some of these things because they might be a little bit difficult to get a handle on. Um, now we're going to start... Uh, with why, or why am I actually giving this talk, or why would I like to give this talk? Um, and before we get quite to that, uh, I'd like to give a bit of an introduction. So Vipassana meditation is a meditation that was um, brought, you some say it might be brought back to India, depending on how you view the history, but brought from Burma to India, um, and has expanded to quite a few um, centers and smaller non-centers in a lot of countries around the world. Um, a lot of people ask me after the last time I gave this talk, uh, why do you pay for this? Um, the course is free, and the way that it's financed is by donations, and they only accept donations from old students. So you can't just show up to a center and start giving them money. Um, and the structure of the course is essentially broken down into uh, one-third and two-third slices. So days one through three are fence staring at your nose, classic breathing meditation. And days four through ten, uh, take that nostril-sized circle and move it all around your body. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Um, so the actual why is because every time you try to explain Vipassana, it's very difficult because there's quite a few pieces. Um, and what people tend to focus on, I think, are always the wrong things. So people who have never taken a course always focus on the fact that it's a silent course. Oh my god, you get a talk? What do you do if you can't talk? You go crazy. It doesn't, really doesn't matter. The fact that you can't talk is almost the least relevant component of a Vipassana course uh, there is to discuss. Um, the food is more interesting than the silence. So um, the second thing is that people who've taken one course 
will come away from the course and their mind is blown and they think they've gone crazy or they had some weird, crazy experience. And then they just tell you about their individual experience, like, oh, I saw God, oh, I saw my childhood, or whatever, right? And that is also irrelevant. That doesn't really matter. That only pertains to that one person, and that's very contextual. You weren't there with them. Um, so I'd like to move from why to caveats. I've only taken two 10 day courses. So I'm essentially this same person, but like one step away where I'm talking about the thing that you talked about when you take two courses, then when you take three, this talk will be completely different. Um, and I will be taking uh, a third course in a week, actually. So had I given this talk in December or January, it would have been a completely different talk. Um, caveat number one um, is something that I hear a lot. So you hear this from people who've learned something for the first time. They were like, oh, I learned, you know, this martial art, or I learned this programming language, and they really want to teach it to everybody else, and that's a great instinct, but they really are the wrong people to teach, and that's probably partly why I'm doing this, is I want to teach people things, and so um, take everything that I say with a grain of salt, because I'm not uh, teaching you Vipassana, which is caveat number two, I am not teaching you Vipassana. You're not learning Vipassana from this talk. Um, and I actually cannot teach Vipassana. So a 10-day course is the introductory Vipassana course. Um, teachers have to do at least one, it might be multiple, 60-day Vipassana courses before they're allowed to teach, um, which is probably something I'll never get to. And when I initially gave this uh, at Hack Beach, um, Hack Beach is mostly about doing things and building things, um, and they like workshops. And so I had to explain with this line, and I felt it was valuable to keep it in, that this can't be a workshop because I can't, do Vipassana with you in 45 minutes or however long we have. Uh, caveat number three I added um, just before we sat down. I am not a neuroscientist, so I attempt to kind of figure out what was going on in my body on the last course that I did, um, but I don't understand all the specifics of how neurons work or like the neurons in the nervous system versus neurons in the brain. Um, if you take a Vipassana course, there will almost certainly be neuroscientists there. And they're fun to talk to because they know a lot about what you've just experienced and hearing them describe it in scientific terms is a lot kind of more validating than hearing people describe their different crazy experiences. Um, so again, I haven't really said why this talk. I've said why not to do other things. Um, I really just want to pique people's curiosity in this because it takes a lot of time and um, it takes a lot of time away from work and other things that you might do. It's essentially... 10 days or 12 days that you might otherwise spend on vacation and you're essentially taking away your phone and your laptop and like home cooked food and everything else to go deprive yourself of things um, and I think that people should be interested in this for the right reasons. Um, and so uh, part of where this came out from um, was the second course that I did uh, which is hacking Vipassana in um, a different sense of the word which is that I was trying to figure out what Vipassana was, and I was trying to figure out the structure of the course, and I was trying to figure out what was happening inside my own body. Um, and I was doing that by partly not actually really meditating properly, um, but I'll get to that. Um, so before we dive into the actual Vipassana stuff, I said the intro would take forever, um, I'd like to describe what we're leaving out. And so first and foremost, um, We've already said that this is um, not about administrative details, so this isn't about the fact that you can't talk um, or any of the other stuff that happens in the 10 days. It's not a discussion about spirituality. I don't actually really believe in spirituality. I don't really know what that word means. I don't think it's really relevant uh, to the conversation or to this presentation. Um, this is not at all about the specifics of past experiences, although we'll create an exception toward the end. Um, and it's not a comparison with other meditation techniques. I actually thought about including that, but that would basically double the length of the presentation, comparing it to Zazen and other forms of uh, Vipassana. This Vipassana specifically is Vipassana as taught by S.N. Goenka, which will be the first Google result you get if you Google the word Vipassana. Um, but there are other uh, forms of meditation which use the term Vipassana to describe themselves. So, the 10-day course ends with a cute little story about kheer, um, milky dessert uh, that you sometimes get, and you'll actually get it on the 10th day of the course as you return back to reality. Um, and the cute story is about a mom and her daughter, and the daughter doesn't like kheer. And so 
she says, there's stones in the kid, and the mom is like, they're not stones, they're nuts, just take them out if you don't like them. And so Goenka, in his recordings, Vipassana is taught on video recordings, which is very weird, but we'll leave that out, that's administrative detail. Um, he says, if there's a part of this that you don't like, take it out. Like, just keep the meditation, that's the important part. And so we're going to take out a bunch of stuff. Um, we're going to take out spirituality for this conversation for any sense uh, of the word and for any definition of the word. Um, if you talk to people who try to approach meditation from like a non-religious perspective, they often spend a lot of time trying to define spirituality. I just won't bother. Um, we'll take out Siddhartha Gautama. So like Buddhists obviously believe that there was a person 2,500 years ago named Siddhartha Gautama who achieved enlightenment, whatever that is. Um, so we can't remember the history from 60 years ago and in some ways the internet is making it worse, not better. Um, and so we're just going to say, like, maybe that guy existed, maybe he didn't. It actually doesn't matter as far as, like, this activity is concerned. Um, we'll leave out enlightenment because that requires a whole definition in itself. We'll leave out any religion, Buddhism, anything that, like, derives from Buddhism. We will leave out predicting the future, which is another thing that some Buddhists believe is possible if you meditate hard enough and you learn enough about the world or whatever. We will learn out, leave out the notion of kalapas. So this is the Buddhist equivalent to strings and string theory or other subatomic particles, which are essentially the uh, smallest irreducible physical particle in the universe. And they're like, they have a name and we've identified them as blah. Um, supposedly 2,500 years ago, they were named Kalapas and now we have other names for them that physicists have come up with. Doesn't matter. We're not going to talk about those things. We're not going to talk about reincarnation because that doesn't really affect the whole uh, neurological approach that we're looking at. We're not going to talk about energies. Um, for any value of energy or vibration or any of those sorts of things. We are not going to talk about metta um, or morality. So there is a last meditation that you do in a Vipassana course. It's only like five minutes at a time on the very last day, which is loving kindness, which is uh, metta in Pali. Um, so the reason to leave this out is because it has an opinion. It's telling you that universal love is a thing and that maybe you should try it. Um, the rest of Vipassana meditation does not have an opinion. It just says, do this thing to yourself and see what happens, basically. Um, so we'll leave out any sense of morality just so that we can keep this in a very kind of cold, <laughs> isolated, um, as scientific as possible uh, box. Um, and then the last uh, thing that we'll leave out is um, sankharas, but we'll divide this into kind of two categories. So sankharas, um, in the notion of your mind or your body being impure somehow, um, which is a part of Vipassana, we'll leave that aside and say we don't, because that seems a little judgmental, or at least the word choice seems judgmental, um, and it doesn't seem necessary for the time. So, morality, these are some of the rules that you have to follow in the course, doesn't matter, um, but we're going to hold on to one of these things. So we'll make an exception for lying. You're not allowed to lie on the talk, which is pretty easy because you can't talk. Sorry, you're not allowed to lie on the course, which is easy because you can't talk. Um, the lying thing is important because you can lie to yourself. Um, so during the course, you could be feeling something and telling yourself you're feeling something else. That's a lie, and your body's actually going to be aware of that lie, which you'll see if you ever take the course. Um, your body kind of knows when you're trying to trick it, uh, or your mind does, one or the other. Um, and then when we take a look at sankaras, I said we divide them into two categories of things. Um, we'll leave out impurities or like taintedness or whatever. And we will hold on to the notion of habits. So um, habits of the brain and nervous system are things like, I don't need to think to type anymore. I type all day, every day. I don't think about it. There's no real active brain uh, thing going on. That's a habit of my fingers to translate words uh, or characters that I want to put into the screen um, through my fingers without much intervention on my part. Um, and there are other habits that you tend to have. So. If you're like me and you're an incredibly angry, anxious person, you have angry, anxious habits. And so you get into a fight with somebody and you get really anxious in the fight and then you get angry and then that kind of boils and spirals out of control. Um, those habits are partly due to uh, the autonomic nervous system that we discussed earlier. Uh, so we're gonna leave out this whole thing, um, but just to look at it briefly, there's no books, there's no talking, there's no looking people in the eye, actually. There's no touching other people, there's no making sounds. Um, and it all does help you meditate, because you're focused on yourself. Um, but you don't really need to worry about it. If you were to describe the mechanics of a Vipassana course, eat, sleep, poop, bath, meditate. That is all you're doing. There is nothing else. You can look at 
monkeys and birds. Like there are monkeys and birds because they can't keep them out of the core site. So you can watch them do their thing and that's as much excitement as you're going to get. Um, and so getting away from the introduction, uh, we started with a hacker mentality. Um, and I think that this picture sums up a lot of what the hacker mentality is. So kids are really great hackers, right? Any kids. It does not like some sort of uh, preconceived thing that certain people are better at than other people. It's curiosity. It's wanting to pull things apart. It's wanting to find out how things work. It's mentorship, right? So if there's somebody older or more experienced than you at what you're trying to figure out, it's great to go get their hand in things and then especially uh, get you kind of kicked off and bootstrapped in the process <coughs> of hacking on stuff. Um, and hackers, I added this, um, we love reason and rationality, right? We love to be able to reason about a problem. We sort of like take the problem as a whole and then break it down into pieces and find the smaller pieces and then chop those up until we can solve the problems and then we move those aside and then we solve the next problem and we move on. Um, and this applies to all sorts of things. So this isn't just software. So this was originally going to be very software oriented talk. Um, I think that it applies to almost all disciplines where you're applying this mentality, right? So it could be architecture, it could be baking bread, um, it could be bicycles, it doesn't particularly matter. Um, and so for the traditional nerd hacker who loves taking apart hardware and taking apart software, um, we do that with almost everything, right? So if you find these people in your friend circles or in your community, they love to take things apart and they will take everything apart, right? So software developers I know who ride bicycles love to learn how the bicycle works. Software developers I know who like to drive cars, you generally like to know how the car works and like to be able to service them themselves. Why don't we turn that inwards more often? Um, and I think that we do try, right? So we like to talk. And so that's the thing is like, if you love riding bicycles, you spend just as much time talking about riding bicycles as you do actually riding bicycles. Um, and I'm as guilty of this as anybody. Um, so uh, Arun actually brought this up when I was at the uh, Hasgeek um, uh, open house on Friday. He was talking about, do you know about the homunculus fallacy or the homo homunculus argument, which is that you have a little man inside your head and he's driving and controlling you. But then if he's seeing whatever your eyes are projecting on the screen, how do you not wind up in an infinite recursion of homunculuses, which of course is why it's a fallacy. Um, but we've constructed some really kind of nice media around this, right? So this was um, kind of acclaimed by quite a few people and actually people in uh, the psychology, um, I don't think neuroscience field, as being kind of like a nice analog and representation for how your mind actually works and how your personality actually emerges. Um, that's for children. For adults, there's Ofstad, right? So there's Godel, Godel Escherbach, and there's I Am A Strange Loop, which was the replacement for Godel Escherbach. So he was like, I need to figure this out, and he wrote about music and art and life and biology and Zen and all these different things, and he tried to like compress it down into a book, and it was this massive tomb, and then he was like, wait, I did it all wrong, I'll do it again with I Am A Strange Loop, and he tried again. Um, and then he was invited to Strange Loop 2013, and he gave the keynote. And I was really excited, because I actually enjoyed what parts of these books I've read. I have not read all of uh, GMB. Um, and his keynote really fell flat, because he has all this material, and it's really beautiful when it's written down, but when he tries to distill it into a one-hour talk, he can't really get to some conclusion that helps you with whatever he's talking about. He can't really define consciousness or define the self for you. Um, and everybody I know is really disappointed in this. Um, and I think the, the danger is um, that effectively what you're doing by trying to stand back from the self or the notion of self or consciousness from wherever it comes and look at it and say, okay, I'm going to dig it apart but at a distance. I'm not actually going to do anything. You're effectively like an open source mailing list troll or somebody who reads a single book on genetics that's really well written and then goes talk to talks to a geneticist and is like, I understand your field and I understand all the things that you do uh, with R and statistics and whatever you do all day, right? If you haven't actually dug around in your own body and your brain, you don't really know this that intimately. Um, and so shifting gears uh, to another um, 
aspect of hacking, I do think that um, it's worth holding on to the notion of Lisp as a programming language for software hackers, right? There are other kinds of hackers, but um, I'm a software developer, so it's the most approachable for me. Um, this is an ESR quote, and think of him what you will, right? He's not necessarily the greatest person, but he has um, how to be a hacker as a document. It's been up on the web for a long time, and he says, learn Lisp to change your own brain, right? Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, maybe use Lisp day to day, but at least uh, learn Lisp so that you really get it. And he even uses the term enlightenment. And if we look at Lisp, um, Lisp as a programming language has some really neat concepts baked into it. Um, so one is homoiconicity, right? So Lisp as a programming language for people who are not programmers in the audience um, has this notion of homoiconicity, which means that the programming language itself is represented in the data structures and the recursive data structures. Um, which it consumes as data. And so it does this interesting thing. It was uh, like in the early days of computing where they recognized programs and computer and data have to be separate things, right? You have to separate those out and the programs work on the data and there's a relationship there. And then Lisp says, yes, that's true. And then I'm going to mush them back together in this neat self-referential kind of cascading sort of way. Um, and that allows you to do some really fantastic metaprogramming. Um, what that means for metaprogramming is that because the program is written in the data structures it consumes, there is no glass ceiling to the metaprogram. So if you're programming in Lisp, there's no top. You can't ever get to a point where you can't metaprogram the thing that you just metaprogrammed. It's infinitely recursive in a way uh, that most programming languages, other than things that are Lisps, because Lisp is a dialect of programming languages, are not. Um, it's also uh, capable of self-mutation and self-replication, so you can take the program that you wrote and then you can write a program that mutates that program and create a new program, which is kind of neat, that's a little bit like biology. Um, it's turtles all the way up, as I just described, so there's no glass ceiling to programs that you write in Lisp. Um, and then Lisp as a sort of almost but not really functional programming language, depending on your definition of functional, um, has these notion notions of recursion and trampolining, which is that um, if I define a mathematical function in Lisp, or any variant of Lisp, that thing can call itself, and it can call itself any number of times, infinitely. Um, and trampolining is taking that and saying, I could have two things, and they could be calling each other infinitely, and they could just keep on going on forever and ever. Um, where this gets a little sketchier as an analog um, is in the world of Clojure, which is a Lisp, um, and Fortress, which is not. Uh, with the notions of immutable, immutability, concurrency, and mastering time. So um, in the 80s, we tried to model the world by saying, I have a chair, I am going to create capital C chair, and then I'm going to make instances of chair, and that was like the whole object-oriented phenomenon. Now, uh, we've kind of managed memory management and all that sort of thing. We're on to time, so we have um, a lot of, this computer probably has eight cores in it, I don't know what. Um, computers are really fancy and they're trying to do a lot of things simultaneously, and time and the speed of light all of a sudden become really important constraints for computer programmers. So fixing time um, is something that Clojure tries to do, Fortress tries to do it differently using uh, algebra and fancy math and things like that. Um, but that's a bit of an aside. So Vipassana, is or would appear to be turtles all the way down in the same way that Lisp is turtles all the way up. So Lisp is not turtles all the way down, although people have described it that way. So even if you're running on a Lisp machine from the 60s, say, um, so you have Lisp, and then your Lisp virtual machine is written in Lisp, and then you're running on a Lisp machine, at some point you get to wires, right? And the wires are not made of Lisp, probably. Um, they're probably like bound by the laws of physics and that sort of thing. Um, Vipassana, is digging into your consciousness using your consciousness, right? So there isn't really a bottom to get to, like, aha, I found it, the virtual machine, or I found it, the hardware, and like, now I can just go read the specification for human consciousness hardware and I'll know what's going on. Um, so before we get into the mechanics of Vipassana, uh, we need to spend a little bit of time suspending disbelief, because this is part of the reason that you can't actually explain Vipassana in like a 30 second uh, blurb to somebody, because there are some parts to it that don't really seem real at first, especially the way that people tend to describe them. 
So the first one is the easiest. Uh, meditation is the thing. Like we're going to, for the course of this talk, uh, we're going to believe that meditation is the thing. And what that means um, is that you can focus your attention on a single thing and you can maintain that attention without getting distracted by thinking about your taxes or whatever. Um, number two is a little harder. So number two is that your brain and your nervous system and we'll use those two entities for the sake of argument because that's kind of how I visualize it, are tied together in a feedback loop faster and tighter than you could ever imagine without experiencing it. So this means that things are happening in your brain and in your body at a speed that you really couldn't fathom if you kind of saw it laid out on a timeline right now on a sheet of paper. You would just be like, no, human beings don't do that. Um, and then the third suspension of disbelief is the hardest one because it sounds goofy. Um, dissolution of the body is a thing. Dissolution of the body is not magic. It's not like levitation or uh, like ESP or something like that. Dissolution of the body is um, the ability to see through your own body, which actually doesn't seem that unreasonable. So your entire body is connected with your nervous system. And if you had a pain on the inside of your body right now, you would feel it, like your brain is attached to that part of your body, right? But day to day, we feel like the outside of our body is the only part that we really communicate with. So we're seeing things, we're hearing things, and we're feeling things with our hands and feet and whatever. But we don't really think like, oh yeah, if I really focused, I could like feel the shape of my stomach and know what it feels like. Um, you kind of have to believe that that's possible uh, to comprehend the rest of this. So. Suspend that disbelief, go back to your disbelief after the talk if you like. Um, but all it really is is saying that you can calm down the outer parts of your body enough to get inside and start feeling things. Um, and so the two courses that I've taken, I have not felt the shape of my stomach, right? I have felt the bones inside of my fingers, I felt like the blood vessels and that sort of things, but things that I do not normally feel at all. Um, and that will prove relevant uh, once we actually start to get to the mechanics of the bus. So um, I'm going to uh, look into virtual reality, the matrix paradox, and attention now. Um, so starting with virtual reality, mostly because I stole this slide from Michael Abrush. So uh, Michael Abrush is, um, I forget his actual title, but he works on the Oculus Rift team at Facebook. Um, and so at the F8 conference, he gave this somewhat stilted talk about um, virtual reality and what is reality really. So what is reality to you? If I can tell your brain that you're experiencing a thing, then you can't know that that's not actually reality to you. And this is, of course, the matrix paradox. Everybody knows this. Everybody saw the matrix and probably thought of this long before the matrix ever came out. Um, what Michael Abrish's slide is missing is uh, some senses, actually. Um, so he has the classic five senses and where they're wired up in the brain, but he's missing um, a large collection of senses uh, that are often thought of as the sixth sense or the sixth senses or the internal senses. Um, there isn't a whole lot of agreement on how to name these, actually. So proprioception, we've talked about before, which is where is my body in space? Do I know that I'm standing up? I'm not falling down. I'm sitting down. I'm lying down, whatever. Um, nociception or nociception is uh, your sense of pain. So if your stomach does hurt, you feel that. And your brain registers it. You know that your stomach is there. Um, and then hunger and other things going on inside your body are not really the sense of touch. Right? That's kind of usually what we associate with the nervous system and the nervous system sending signals to the brain. But your sense of touch is primarily outside. Um, and there are a bunch of other internal uh, senses that operate this way. And then the seventh sense, um, so Buddhists, uh, to like break my rule and talk about Buddhism for a second, Buddhists would refer to this as the sixth sense door, um, so the mind. So if you are completely deprived of your senses, you still have your thoughts, you still have your memories, you still have your dreams, you still have math, right? um, whatever's going on inside of you, uh, which is primarily thoughts and emotions. Um, if you think of those things as being different. Um, and so you're doing Vipassana already. Uh, you're just very bad at it. We're all very bad at it. Um, Vipassana is actually just taking this array of senses or sensory inputs and trying to choose the ones that you want and to poke at them a little bit. So 
where is your attention? And you kind of have to take some extreme examples to think of where your attention might be, right? So the first one is not that extreme. Um, we've all been in a bustling restaurant, and if you think of yourself as being in a bustling restaurant right now, you can imagine maybe how this graph would lay up. So if you're sticking a fork in your mouth, um, you're putting food in, you're tasting the food, your sense of taste is very active, and a lot of your attention is focused on that. And probably the bustling restaurant has a lot of noise in behind the, uh, your table or whatever, and you're hearing some of that, so your hearing sense is very aware. Your other senses are maybe kind of quiet, right? Let's assume that you're not super worried about what's going on at work or whatever that day. And probably, interestingly enough, um, you don't have a lot of attention focused on proprioception and uh, the internals of your body unless you've eaten something really spicy or something uh, like that. So another example, which is a little more extreme, um, is a sensory deprivation tank. So if people haven't seen one of these, I've only just used one of these very recently, uh, my last trip back to Canada. Um, a sensory deprivation tank looks like this. There's a light inside that you turn off once you get inside, and you float in this water, and you feel mostly nothing. So you feel the water against your skin, but it's uh, laden with every conceivable kind of salt so that you're very buoyant and you stay on top uh, so you don't drown, bonus. Um, and there's no sound and there's no light and there's no smell and you're obviously not tasting anything while you're in there and you're feeling as little as possible in the tactile sense. Um, and so if anybody's ever seen that episode of The Simpsons where Homer uh, goes into a sensory deprivation tank uh, with Lisa, they both go into one and they both hallucinate and um, they see neat stuff. Actually, Homer goes for a ride. And Lisa, Lisa hallucinates. Um, sensory deprivation tank is much like this. So um, you might have a little more sense of touch than this is laying out. But and of course, it's important to remember that these are all moving all the time, right? So like, if you splash the water, you'll hear the splash, and the your hearing thing will go up a little bit. So they're all sort of vibrating, but they'll have a, like a general pattern. Um, and What's interesting is when you're in the sensory deprivation tank, you become a little more aware of what's going on inside your body than you normally are. So that one goes up, and you're definitely thinking, right? So you're in there, and you're relaxing, so you might not be thinking very aggressive thoughts, hopefully, um, but you're thinking about some stuff, um, and it kind of takes over. So another great example um, for people who haven't tried any form of meditation whatsoever is an anechoic chamber. Um, they look like this. So they are usually covered in large foam wedges, um, and those large foam wedges absorb all sound. Uh, in fact, this anechoic chamber in particular has a decibel rating of minus nine, which means that you will hear absolutely nothing from within the chamber. Um, what you will hear is your own body. And so this is not maybe what you were thinking this graph would look like, but it's actually kind of counterintuitive. You wind up hearing the noises, the ringing in your ears, the little bit of tinnitus that everybody has, the sloshing of the fluids in your body, the grumbling of your stomach, but they're definitely loud. And this tends to drive people a little nuts, and so your brain starts to do a bunch of stuff. Um, so we had trouble at the last talk. He says he's been in an anechoic chamber, not intentionally. He was setting up an experiment. Um, but he said he could only be in there for five minutes before he felt like he was going crazy. Um, the previous anechoic chamber, this one, is actually used to run this... Uh, human psychology experiment. The longest anyone has sat in this chamber is 45 minutes. Um, and then they really needed to get out. Um, so, we're going to move from some kind of concrete examples into the mechanics uh, of Vipassana and um, before that, the mechanics of Anapana, which is uh, breath meditation. Um, and so, the word used in the Vipassana course is samadhi, um, but I've decided not to use this word because um, in other schools of various practices, so um, Hinduism, Buddhism, yogic practices, various things, use the word samadhi to mean totally different things. Um, and we were just uh, looking it up on Wikipedia before I uh, gave the talk, actually, and it means like gravestones and things. So just to avoid any confusion, what we're talking about with Anapana meditation is simply one point of this. So to take your attention to one single point and hold it there for as long as you can, and when your brain drifts away, you bring it back. Um, so it looks like this, you're sitting down. I apologize for the pixelation. Uh, you're on like this cushiony thing. And your focus, your singular focus of attention is your nose, basically. So of all your body that you could be focusing on and anything else in the world, you're focused on your nose. So 
if this is your face, um, <laughs> your brain likes distraction. So before I get to this, you will not just be focused on other physical things, right? You will be focused on your taxes, your mom, Christmas, or whatever is coming up next, uh, people in your family, people at work, um, all these sorts of things that you normally think about. It's hard to stop those thoughts. And so um, as you get a little better at this, I apologize if it's difficult to see. There's kind of pink rings, and then the last one is kind of blurry. Um, you will be finding it difficult to focus your attention under your nose, which is where you're putting your attention. You'll be feeling itching and stuff on your face, but you'll also be thinking about taxes, and you'll also be thinking about your mom, and you'll also be thinking about the pain in your legs because you've been sitting for so long or whatever. But this goes on for three days, and you finally get to a point where you have some narrowed focus of your attention. So you might be able to do this for a few seconds, you might be able to do it for a few minutes, doesn't really matter. You've practiced this and you've gotten a little bit better at holding your attention in one place. Um, so this is essentially our first suspension of disbelief. So meditation is a thing. Um, that's not that hard to kind of get your head around um, attentiveness. And what this looks like in terms of senses is your sense of touch. So your sense of touch just under your nose is feeling the breath moving in and out and it's feeling some itches and uh, sweat and whatever else. I mean, you're probably hearing quite a bit of stuff. Right, So your other senses have quieted down quite a bit, but when someone farts or burps in the meditation hall, you're hearing it, and it's kind of obnoxious. Um, and you'll get annoyed, and your thought process will go to them, and then you bring it back, and you start feeling the thing again. Um, and so Vipassana meditation is what's more interesting uh, for hackers, I think. Um, and Anapana is basically just a way to get there. Um, and <laughs> Nid came up with this terminology that I really like, which is mutually recursive consciousness I.O. So this is um, why to bother introducing Lisp as a concept or uh, software programming in general or computers. Um, so we have a title slide for that. But um, this whole thing that we're about to talk about is primarily about staying calm. So you've now narrowed down your attention to a single place and then now as you're looking at that single place, you want to kind of look at it and just be like, whatever is there, it's okay, and I'm not going to freak out, right? Um, and so what this is, uh, is you move this attention from your nose to the top of your head, and then you move the attention from the top of your head to slightly lower than that, and then you move it around, and then you'll move your way down. There's some intermediary uh, states here. And then you'll get like get to the middle of your body, and you're moving it across your body, and you're doing that, um, and you'll do that all the way down to the tips of your toes, and then you'll work your way back up, and you'll just keep doing it over and over and over, looking at your body with this tiny little spot. Um, and then there are other forms of this, so you'll take like a line and scan your whole body with the line, or you'll look at your whole arm simultaneously. For, this, for the sake of this argument, you can look at the very narrow case um, and just talk about that. So what we're doing now is we're saying, oh, okay, most of our senses are pretty quieted down, right? So we haven't talked to anybody for three days or four days. Um, we haven't read any books. We haven't received any cranky emails, whatever. Um, and so we're focusing ourselves and we get kind of calm and quiet. And now we're focusing all our attention on what our body is doing. Um, and so we're actually starting with the outside, right? So the skin um, and like hair follicles and stuff. So probably to begin with, uh, the sense of touch is more important. Um, but if you can move away from this notion um, that dissolution of the body is not a thing, then very quickly you start to move inside and feel blood and like tingly things inside your body and stuff. Um, and so what this looks like for me personally is uh, a lot of pain in my knees. Um, so I'm Canadian and I never saw cross legged as a child ever. <laughs> so when I came to my first meditation course, which was not a Vipassana course, and I went to go sit down cross-legged for three days, it hurts a lot. And that's pretty much the only thing I can think of. So very quickly, thoughts of taxes and my mom get replaced with thoughts about how I wish my knees weren't hurting all the time. Um, so this is mostly what my med personal meditation diagram looks like. And what's interesting is if you can narrow the focus of your meditation object, which is just like a patch of skin or whatever, like part of your body, um, small enough, right? And it's kind of fuzzy, so it sees things around it. So if you're focused on your neck, probably you're feeling the top of your chest and you're feeling your chin and stuff simultaneously because you can't really help it. But 
if I'm focused on my neck, I might not actually feel my knees at all. And probably not to start with, right? But maybe on day eight or nine, the pain in my knees goes away until I move my attention down to my knee. And then I'm like, oh crap, my knee still hurts. That's crazy. And then I move away from my knee and then it doesn't hurt anymore. And then every time I get down to my knee and it's hurting, if I can stay calm the rest of the time, uh, my nervous system or my senses, however my body, however you want to kind of categorize it, seems to calm itself down. And so every time I get to my knee, I'm like, oh, it hurts a little less than last time. And then I go up and try and be calm everywhere else. And then when I get to my knee, still trying to be calm, they're like, oh, it's hurting a little bit less again. And you get more relaxed and more relaxed and you're freaking out a little bit less all the time. Um, so what's interesting is this is a very personal example. But if you can't feel the pain in your knees, despite the fact that the pain is real, it's there, your knees are still trying to tell your brain, like, I hurt, I hurt, do something about this, stand up, go away. Um, you can effectively eliminate all the rest of your sensory input, right? So this isn't just for knees, you're not just turning off pain in your knees, you're turning off all sorts of things. And so all these other graphs that have had these senses wiggling around a little bit, right? And probably even in this graph, they're wiggling around a little bit, but they're getting closer and closer and closer to nothing. So you're not actually receiving any sensory input. Um, one other personal example that I can lean on uh, to talk about this and why this is different than being in a sensory deprivation tank. So being in a sensory deprivation tank or being in a meditation chamber where it's completely dark and my eyes are closed, um, I have a personal advantage, which is that I had a botched eyeball surgery last year. Um, and the botched eyeball surgery crushed the center of my optic nerve. Um, and so what that does is when I close my eyes, I see a yellow oval uh, right in the center of my eye. And if the world is completely dark and my eyes are completely closed, I still see that yellow oval. And I will see that yellow oval just all the time. It's always there. Um, and so what happens is at some point, that goes away. So just because you're in the dark, just because your eyes are closed, does not mean you've deprived yourself sense of the sense of sight. Your nerves are still active. They're still talking to your brain. But at some point, they will quiet down to the point where they're not actually trying to do that anymore. They're not trying to tell me, oh, there's a yellow oval over there. They're just like, whatever, it's all turned off, don't worry about it. Um, and what's interesting here is that your, your thought process has quieted down quite a bit, right? So taxes and mom and Christmas presents are gone. And what that's been replaced with is a totally different type of thought, um, which is probably impossible to describe to somebody who hasn't experienced this directly. Um, but this thing, this new thought, uh, and I put thoughts in quotes, and it's not normal thought at all, um, becomes a totally new kind of distraction. Um, because your brain really likes distraction, right? And we all kind of know this. So um, when you're trying to sleep because you have a really important thing to do the next day, um, your brain is doing all sorts of crazy things and focusing on all sorts of stuff that you don't want it to, right? And your brain sort of seems to be out of your control. You can't say, all right, brain, we're going to go to sleep now and you're going to stop thinking these things. Um, and this is sort of the normal version of this. But the crazier version of this, the Vipassana version of this, is where you seem to be looking at your nervous system over and over and over again, and its connection with the brain is kind of poking at the brain and it's saying, do something weird. Do something weird, like why don't you just wake up and be active, right? Like you stop thinking about taxes, so now think about what the body is prodding you into doing. And so you can break this down into a few ways. Uh, so Cherry was saying after the last time I gave this talk, arguably these things are the same system, right? So the brain and the nervous system can be thought of as a single system. The brain and the body can be th thought of as a single system. Uh, the brain and the body can be thought of as separate, or the brain and the nervous system, however you want to dice it up. But there's some either recursion or mutual recursion uh, happening here. Um, and so when we say that the brain and body, I'm going to say that the brain and body or the brain and nervous system are two chunks, right? And that they're mutually recursive, so they're trampolining between each other. Um, and to take it aside for a second, pain is a great example of this, right? So you'll, you'll see this uh, when I was saying if you get to your knees and they're in pain and you're calming them down, you're like, I'm calm, I'm calm, and they start to get better, um, that is the reverse of this spiraling recursive process, which is you get to your knee and it hurts and you freak out, right? You're like, oh my god, my knee is hurting. And you think that and then your knee hurts more. And your brain is telling your nervous system, like, clench up your muscles and be uncomfortable. And this kind of winds up more and more, which is 
Um, the way in which you get angry without being intellectually angry, right, and all the other things that are going inside, um, going on inside your brain and body. Um, when we say mutually recursive, to come back to this, um, this is not existential. This isn't that the brain could not live without the nervous system or the body or vice versa. This is operational. So what I just described, um, the pain cycle of it hurts, oh my god, I'm afraid, I'm freaked out, I'm mad at myself for doing this, oh my god, it hurts, it hurts more, it just keeps getting worse and worse until I can calm down and unwind the stack. Um, so this begs the question, uh, can we actually see that this is what's happening? Can we ha hack Vipassana? So can we take Vipassana and look at it from the outside and dig it apart and peel it apart and figure out what the real internals are. And so I'm going to lean on Martin Thompson, who is a really uh, intense um, JVM hacker. So I know that this talk is kind of geared toward all hackers, not just software hackers, um, but for the software hackers in the crowd. Uh, Martin Thompson has this great slide where he talks about he's built a Death Star and he has all these distributed load testing agents that are attacking his Death Star. So he's essentially saying, I built a software system and then I wrote software that attacks the software system by overloading it, and I want to assert that my software system holds up to the attack, right? And what he says is you cannot put that assertion in the X-Wings and you can't put it in the Death Star because they are both biased, right? They are both seeing this thing from their own perspective. The performance of the Death Star is itself influenced um, by the observation of the performance of the Death Star, and the observation is influenced by the performance, same with the X-Wings. Um, and so what he says is stick an observer in there, this third-party observer, right, an objective observer. And the objective observer can see how many lasers are being shot and how much damage is being done or whatever in his case. And that's a great way of testing software where you're completely outside of the software system altogether, right? But when it comes to consciousness, you're stuck. So if you put in a third-party observer and you say, I have a machine that tells me exactly what my brain and body are doing this whole time that I'm meditating, Guess what? When you go to read the machine, you're using your eyes and you're using your brain to process that information, right? If what you want to understand is your unconsciousness, you cannot get away from this recursion. There is no way out of this trap, right? So you are stuck observing, uh, observing the observable thing with the observable thing, right? The observer is the observed, and there's no way to kind of prevent that. Um, so this this whole section um, leans implicitly on this, this thing, this thing that we've decided we're going to suspend disbelief about, which is the dissolution of the body as a thing. Because if you believe that your brain and nervous system are constantly interacting in some sort of back and forth or mutually cursive ping pong, um, you have to be able to get to all the parts of the nervous system, right? If all you could see is the nervous system that affects your skin, you're saying like, as good as I am at meditating on my skin, that's how much I can do Vipassana, right? right? So you have to be able to get to the root of it, um, which in Vipassana is supposedly your spinal cord. I haven't done that, um, but that would be neat. Um, and let's go back uh, to the whole thing about lying. Um, so here, where we're in this mutually recursive thing, and you're actually, so when you're doing this, you're watching this, right? You're watching your thoughts because you can sort of see your thoughts without being too engaged in them. You're watching the effect on your body, and you're watching the effect of the body and your thoughts and whatever. Um, or your emotions, if you're upset about uh, whatever's going on in your body. Um, honesty helps you with this whole dissolution of the body thing, right? So if you go into Vipassana and you're like, I am going to see you right through to my spinal cord, and like, that's what I'm going to feel, and that's what I'm feeling right now, that's not going to work. You have to see whatever is there. So if you're feeling itchy or you feel hungry or whatever, you have to just kind of look at that thing and be like, okay, it's there, until your brain sort of gets bored of seeing that, and then it'll go look for something else. And you'll actually start to see through your skin or your blood vessels or whatever you're seeing through. Um, and so that's why this whole not lying thing is not a question of morality. It's a question of the actual mechanics of the meditation because the meditation won't work without um, doing this. You'll find this out though, it's interesting. So if you happen to lie to yourself, you will detect it. You will be very aware that like, oh, this, like, I'm just getting stuck on this thing and it's not really actually happening. Um, so then what becomes uh, your new distraction <laughs> um, is that 
all these senses that you've turned off will or may come back to life. Um, and so now we are really in the matrix paradox, right? So the classic matrix paradox is, how do we know that Earth, like Bangalore 2015 and all these people that I know and like my thought processes and my taxes, how do I know that they're real and they're not just a computer program and I'm like a piece of software or whatever? That's the usual matrix paradox. So the reverse is when Vipassana causes your senses to come back to life effectively and tell you that other things are going on. Um, so this is where mutually recursive consciousness I.O. comes into the picture. So this is where you've taken this like, I'm hurting or I'm angry or whatever, stack, right? And you've unwound it to the point that you're pretty calm and you're very placid and everything is going very nicely. And now it starts to wind itself back up again, but in a totally different kind of way, completely new kind of distraction that you're probably not that familiar with. I mean, if you've taken hallucinogenic drugs, perhaps, right? Um, salvia, in particular, is legal in most countries. It's a terrible experience, I don't recommend it. But one of the effects of salvia is that uh, you will feel as though you were transported to another dimension in another time, or another time in your life, so back to childhood, and you fully experience all the things uh, in that other dimension or that other time, right? So when you come out of being high from... Uh, Salvia, and I wouldn't really describe it as a high because it's really unpleasant. Um, you will have walked around the room and you will have like picked up things and done things and you will not remember any of it. Uh, what you'll remember is, oh no, I should have turned up, off my uh, thing. Sorry, this is, that's <laughs> to help my broken eyeball. Um, and so uh, that's the only experience I can think of to, to relate to what is happening here. Um, in Vipassana. And so I did say that we wouldn't talk um, that much about the experience of Vipassana, but I think that it helps to lean on a couple of concrete examples. So in the same way that when you go to use an API or when you go to put together a piece of furniture, it helps to see the example of like, these two things go together like this. Um, and we won't spend much time on this, but I'm going to start with a non-example. Um, and this is actually when you go to YouTube and you Google Vipassana experiences. This is what you will always find, right? You will find the people who are like, I saw the craziest thing and I unraveled all the mysteries of the universe. And like, they basically constructed a paradox and then resolved the paradox for themselves in a way that's not communicable through normal language. And so if you have a mathematical or linguistic paradox that cannot be communicated to another person, there's really no point in talking about it at all. Um, so that's why not to watch those YouTube videos and why to skip over that non-example. So a better concrete example um, would be uh, Nid. So Nid was on the last Vipassana course that I took. Um, and in one of the later days, uh, she had this experience where she was in the middle of meditating and all of a sudden it felt as though she was transported to our friend Philippe's house. Uh, and she was sitting at the dinner table and she was holding Raphael, Philippe's two-year-old son. Um, and it wasn't that she was dreaming this, and it wasn't that she was imagining or thinking about that memory. It was physically reliving that memory as though she were really there, as though that were really happening. Um, so that's one. So that's like your sense of touch is like comes back, and you probably your sense of smell with the dinner or stuff. I don't know if that's true or not. I'm making that up. But, um, and so a one for me was writing a poem. So this doesn't actually sound like all your senses coming back to life. But this was my senses coming back to life in a way, uh, mostly my mental sense, right? In a way that I'd never seen before. So my brain was basically over here going, I have written the most beautiful poem you will ever hear. This is the greatest thing on earth and you're wasting your time over here meditating. Come finish the poem, write the last line of the poem. That's all you have to do. You did this anyway, your brain did this for you. Just finish off the poem. And it's your brain doing this weird thing of like, tempting you not with taxes, but with like beauty and art. So like, stop meditating. I don't want you to meditate anymore. Come do this other thing. It's obviously not real. I hadn't actually written the world's most beautiful poem. It was just this kind of figment of my imagination, but it was also very concrete. It was something that I was experiencing directly. So then we get into things that are a little harder uh, to kind of um, imagine or harder to like come in contact with. 
um, but are still approachable, right? So like time slowing down is one. Um, and time slowing down is probably a poor way of describing this. Um, so one specific experience is going for the early morning meditation in particular. So it starts at 4 a.m. and it goes for two hours. Uh, so it actually, um, sorry, it's 4.30 to 6.30 a.m. Um, but you can start it at 4 a.m. when the first bell goes off if you want. So you can sit there for two and a half hours. And sometimes you get in a really deep meditative state where your senses are doing all these crazy things and you feel like a lot of stuff is going on. Um, when I say time slowing down, I mean it feels like you've been teleported to another place and you're experiencing other things for an incredibly long time. Like tens of thousands or twenties of thousands of years, like or hundreds of thousands of years. It's really hard to kind of get a handle on what you think you've experienced. But you come out of this and be like, whoa, I just teleported to another dimension and I just experienced a hundred thousand years worth of time like that. Um, and then you have to kind of think about what's really happening. Um, or alternatively, time speeding up, right? So sometimes you'll just go to, and particularly in the later days of the course, you'll go and sit down for this two and a half hours or one hour, and you'll sit down and you'll be like, all right, time to meditate. You're gonna start meditating, and then all of a sudden, the, heat, the thing goes off, the sounds, um, that tell you that it's done, right? And you're like, I didn't meditate yet. Like, I just sat down a second ago. This really shouldn't have happened. Um, and then what's more confusing and less approachable is this idea of time going backward. And so it will feel like cause and effect internally have been reversed and you're like traveling time in a different direction. Not necessarily just backward, but like sliding back and forth and stuff, um, which is extremely difficult to describe as, a, as an experience. And I don't have a drug-related uh, corollary for that. Um, I don't think that there are drugs that make you feel this, or at least I hope not, because it's quite scary. Um, but those are uh, some examples, uh, concrete examples. And so finally, we get to outcomes. Um, and so uh, the, le the kind of final outcome is, so okay, great, you can have all these crazy experiences and you can like play with your senses and your brain in all sorts of ways that maybe you haven't tried before or maybe you have but you've done differently. Um, what happens? after the meditation is over, because that's sort of the whole point of doing meditation, is not just to sit there silently for 10 hours a day, but to have something happen to you. Um, so first off, uh, I'm gonna lean on Michael Abrush's uh, Oculus, Oculus Rift um, virtual reality talk again, where um, perception is relative, and he brings up this example, right? So we all know this meme that was floating around Twitter and Facebook and stuff the dress, right? And people were like, oh my gosh, I see it this way. Oh my gosh, I see it this way. Different colors. And they were like, wow, people with different bodies and eyes see things differently. And it's not that revelatory, but people thought it was like pretty neat, right? Um, and so then, of course, there's always like these uh, visual tricks that you can do. So perception is relative with yourself. And so the Japanese, um, I think they took the dress and uh, created this, which is like, this is the dress again, but you're seeing two separate colors simultaneously at the same time, even though they're the same. This is kind of a classic trick. There are all sorts of these. Um, and so what I'd like to talk about is not the dress, but the cow. Um, so there was a really adorable, I guess, uh, cow that would wander around the meditation center on the last course that I took, um, chewing on things and doing cow stuff. And I think it was on the ninth or 10th day that I was filling a bucket with hot water for a bath. And I was watching the cow, and I saw the cow, I looked up and I saw the cow, and I was in like one of these kind of like, I've been meditating for a while, so I feel very like light and airy. And I looked at the cow, and the cow was the most beautiful creature I had ever seen. It was amazing, it was a wonder of nature, it was a work of art. And it was like ready to start believing in God and stuff. And I looked down at my bucket, and I'm like, bucket's still not full, okay, good. And I looked up at the cow, and the cow, was not unlike this cow, actually, like, quite emaciated and bony and horrifying. And I felt really disgusted by, by what I saw in the cow. And all of a sudden, I was like, someone switched the cow. Like, a second ago, with beautiful cow. And now it's a horrifying cow. And I don't understand how, like, these images are so incredibly different from one another, even though the time period that's elapsed. And, like, I'm not doing Vipassana, so time is just normal now. It's like two seconds but these things are completely, completely different. Um, and so that's one of these things um, 
that Babasana seems to do after the meditation is that it's altering your perception somewhat. And you become a little more aware of your own perception. So you're aware of what you're seeing and how you're judging it and how you're evaluating it. So I think this thing is really beautiful and I think this thing is really ugly and I like this thing or I don't. Um, and it seems to change it in kind of drastic ways. Um, and so there's also this. Uh, so, honey, don't forget what the half-life is on the autonomic nervous system is the little cute quote that they have at the end of the Radio Lab podcast where they're talking about how the autonomic nervous system drives you into anger and getting upset either quickly or slowly and then how it uh, kills itself off either quickly or slowly. Um, this whole thing, this autonomic nervous system, is what makes and keeps you angry. And it's also what makes you afraid and sad and anxious and depressed and pretty much everything else. Um, and so at the end of a Vipassana course, you will find that most of these things have been really squished down. So you're still feeling emotions, you're still a human being, but you're not reacting to things the way that you would have 11 days prior. So you're not, I'm not getting upset with people honking a bunch, um, and I'm not getting mad when I see somebody littering in the street, um, and I'm not as attracted or repulsed to things, maybe a cow, say, um, as I would have been. Um, and I'm more aware of how that process is working in my body and how I can pay attention to it to watch it kind of calm down. Um, so that's kind of helpful. So I mentioned that I'm a fairly angry, anxious person by nature. Um, this is why I do Vipassana and why people keep asking, like, why do you pay for this? It's free. But the reason to do this thing, even though it can be fairly unpleasant as an experience, is because it does seem to prove fairly helpful. If you're actually uh, doing a systematic process, and what that systematic process is, is fairly straightforward. Right? You're saying, like, narrow your attention down to this tiny spot, and then just very boringly go over your whole body with it, and just watch whatever your body's doing, and be okay with that until it goes away and kind of calm it down, and then move to another piece, and be okay with that and calm it down, and move to another piece, systematically work through your whole body and calm down your nervous system and maybe your brain, depending on how you've divided this picture up, um, to get better at being calm a lot of the time. Uh, maybe some, maybe automatically or maybe by active practice, like throughout the course of the day. Um, I won't weigh in on that. Um, and then there's this thing. So coming back to the whole uh, hacker's... Um, argument or analogy. So hacking is usually about removing the magic, right? I remember when I first started using the web, um, and I was like, oh, these web pages are showing up on my computer, and they're coming from not my computer. It was like 12 or 11 or something, and I was like, I don't know how this works. I don't understand TCP, IP. I do not understand DNS. I have no concept of what layers are going on underneath the covers. I don't really understand what HTTP stands for. I don't understand why there's a www at the beginning of every web address, which there was at the time, because history. Um, and I didn't understand how any of the software was working on the computer that I was using. I didn't understand the difference between a piece of software and an operating system when I was a kid. Um, some kids do understand these things. But once you go and start hacking these things, right? Or like, I'm going to learn how Netscape Navigator, once it was open source, um, looks internally, or Firefox, right? So you're like, go and look through the Firefox code base and you pull it apart and you're like, ah, okay, there. That's how Firefox works. Um, and you can pull apart machinery and if people like go out of their way to stop you from looking at the insides of their stuff or put a patent in your way, um, then it's harder, right? But for the most part, and sometimes when people put guards in place to stop you from finding out a thing, when you find out that thing, it's the least magical thing imaginable. Right, so you just destroy magic altogether. There's no mystery to a thing that you understand really comprehensively. So far, you <laughs> should two 10 day courses. Vipassana seems to work in the other direction. So the first Vipassana course, I was like, wow, that was really crazy. And then this second Vipassana course, I was like, that was even crazier. And I seem to understand, but now I have a bunch of extra questions. Like I don't understand all sorts of other things about how this actually worked. Um, and so, it's not magic, right? But the mystery of what's going on inside of your body and your brain and the consciousness that's erupting uh, between the two of them um, it seems to just kind of be unbounded as you explore it. So I think that that's kind of neat for hackers and I think that that is a worthwhile argument for saying that hackers who are interested in this should give it a shot.
these are my credits and references. Um, that I do have, so, oh, one of them has gotten cut off. But, um, so uh, these are all the external uh, credits and references. And then the last two um, are a couple of blog posts uh, that I've written, again, to try to distill this stuff for people who would ask me questions and I couldn't really uh, manage it in a verbal conversation over dinner or whatever. Um, so one was just uh, my first Vipassana experience and then describing the mechanics and what does the course actually look like and what happened to me. And then the second um, was for a friend who was asking about experimenting with drugs actually and experimenting with meditation. And so um, I explained all the experiences that I have, the risks and uh, and dangers associated with those things, um, and why maybe not to do some of them, and why some of them are safer and more approachable, um, and whether or not they should be combined, which is almost always no, right? So um, if you're experimenting with anything that has to do with your brain, take it really slowly and do it one step at a time. Um, so those uh, explanations are up on my blog, um, if this did pique your interest in any of these things. Um, and that is the end of my talk. Um, I know you guys have to leave, but uh, if anybody else has questions, um, has usually been good. <laughs> Thanks, Pia. <laughs> really? Nothing? Why well, I knew this thing of course. I mean, I... I don't know really much about the actual sources of the day things about the need to do that. Uh so no. Um so uh interestingly enough, the video lectures, so um uh so sorry, I'm closer to the microphone. The question was <laughs> for the video, um, is there anything stopping you from doing this at home? Um and the uh the kind of literal answer is no. Um, so the, the course is given by video lecture, uh, one hour every evening for 10 days, so 10 hours. <clears throat> and there's a bit of instruction, uh, during the day. So while you're sitting there, while you're sitting there meditating, um, there's some, uh, audio that's played that describes, like, now focus on this part of your nose, now focus on this, like, look for these sensations, that sort of thing. Um, so the thing about that is that the, the audio instruction which is probably more helpful, is not released. Um, so they don't, the Vipassana people, or whatever, they don't really encourage people to do the course on their own um, because you can have some pretty freaky experiences and they would prefer that there's somebody who knows the whole thing very well and can make sure that you're being safe uh, and you're being, that you're okay, right? Like, so there are some people uh, so who really can't handle the course. So you'll find that there are people that leave on like the third and the fifth day as things start getting more intense. Um, and that is uh, universally the one adjective that you will hear people use to describe a Vipassana course. Intense. It's not really relaxing, right? You experience a lot of things in the course. Uh, some of the time it's relaxing. Um, but when people come out, the one adjective that they will use, intense. And so if you're having that on your own at home or whatever, um, that could be a bit freaky. Uh, so they don't release the audio. They do have the videos up on YouTube, so you could watch all 10 videos and you could like try to do a 10-day course on your own. But I would recommend against it, actually. So I actually think that the course setup is, um, it's really neat. It's neat that it's free. Um, and it's neat that anyone can go, so like there's no restriction um, bar one. So the one restriction that they do have is, um, your present mental state. So if you have uh, clinical anxiety or clinical depression, you will not be invited to do a Vipassana course. So Vipassana courses are, uh, they're request-based, so you fill out a form and you send it to them and you're like, can I please take the course? You can try if you have clinical anxiety or depression, but generally uh, the response that comes back is um, we're volunteer driven, our volunteers are not professionals, and if something goes really wrong with you, right, like if you're super depressed, and you get more depressed because of Vipassana, they won't be able to help you in a professional uh, way. Right? Because they're they're just like you and me, they have jobs, they just go there to volunteer their time out of the goodness of their hearts. Um, so um, that, and if you've had like a recent traumatizing life event, which can put you in like a mild temporary depression, so if like 
somebody in your family has died or you've experienced some other form of trauma, don't go on a Vipassana course um, because they'll generally reject you under those circumstances as well. But otherwise, um, it's open to everybody. Um, and uh, the facilities um, match up really well with what you're trying to do. Right? So they feed you at the right time and they wake you up at the right time because the right time is 4 a.m., which is how you do on your own. So they do say at the end of the course, once you've taken this first course and you're kind of like, I know what I'm getting into, um, the recommendation, if you're going to take Vipassana seriously, is to try to do it once a year. So a 10-day course once a year. And the recommendation is, if you can't get away from your home city, uh, to do a 10-day course in your own home with um, like a significant other or a friend um, providing you food and maybe waking you up if they're really thoughtful. Um, so the recommendation is that you could do a course on your own, but only maybe once you've done uh, your first course under their supervision. Um, uh, sorry, say that again. So, can you like do it every day if you don't do that? Or do you have to do it as a post? Like, is it like a rigorous post or anything? Um, so, the, the question was um, can you do it on your own at home? Uh, and do you have to do it in the course setting? Um, so, the the recommendation that you try and do a 10-day course at home, uh, if you can't make it to a course site for your like second and third course, if you want to take more courses, um, <clears throat> I mean, think would intrinsically imply that you can try to do it at home. Um, the other recommendation that they make, right, or that uh, SM Goenka, who's on the videos and stuff, makes, his recommendation is, Vipassana is great for you because it's great for me. So do it lots, right? And his schedule is do it by yourself, one hour in the morning and one hour in the evening, every day. Um, so personally, I try to do that. I can do the morning meditation. So I wake up uh, usually around um, 5, 5.36, and that gives me enough time to do like a one hour meditation before I eat breakfast and everything else and like get into email. Um, I find the evening much harder. Um, and I, so there's actually a Goenka Vipassana uh, group on Insight Timer, which is the little Android app that I use for the gongs. Um, and everybody seems to have the same problem. They're like, I can meditate for like 30, 45 minutes in the morning, but the evening is really hard for me because I have to, I have to make dinner and I have to put the kids to bed and I have to do this and I have to do that. Um, I can wake up an hour earlier before everyone else and do an hour of meditation. So. Um, so, uh, so the question was, is it, uh, where is this balance live? But maybe I'll replay the question to see that I understand it. Um, where does the balance lie between the this crazy intensity of the course versus uh, the utility of doing it day to day for like an hour? Okay. So it, what I want to know is whether it's only about the meditation as well as or the whole course. The intensity of the course, the, the long hours, and uh, without talking. And, uh, like is, is it only about like? Um, so, uh, are you asking, um, is it only about the meditation and the value derived from the meditation, or is it about, excuse me, or is it about the value you derive from the meditation and the course surrounding, so like yeah. the food you eat and yeah. Um, so yes and no. Uh, so the the ultimate objective of structuring the course in that way is to uh, thank you so much. Um, the ultimate objective, uh, as they describe it, 
um, is to help you meditate, right? So um, the reason that you can't talk to other people during the course is because if Nid and I had been at the course and we could just talk whenever, on the fifth day, we both would have been like, I feel like crap. Because after the course, we were both like, was the fifth day really hard for you? Like, lots of emotions and you did want to leave and stuff. And we were both like, yeah, totally. The fifth day was terrible. And so if you could talk to somebody um, and ask that, like, do you want to leave? You would probably both leave. Or you would at least be distracted um, from the meditation itself. Um, so that said, uh, the reason that I focus so much on the <coughs> physical aspects of the meditation or like the mechanics of the meditation is because all those other things, right? The quiet, the uh, dark room that you're in when you meditate in a cell, if you meditate in a cell, um, the long hours, the food that you eat, uh, the fact that you're not allowed to read books, all that stuff, it's only there to kind of move you toward being better at the meditation. So if those things didn't affect your meditation, um, it wouldn't, they probably wouldn't be parameters of the course. Um, so to give like a counter example, because there's only so many things that you can do during the course, right? <clears throat> you can have a bath and you can walk around, right? So like if the course said no bathing for 10 days, the, the idea behind that would be like, baths are bad for meditation, right? It's not like there's some magical reason for any of that stuff. Uh, so intrinsically, like, comparatively, if you remove the meditation, um, and if you, like, go into the wilderness for 10 days by yourself, and you don't talk to anybody, you'll have an experience, but it will be nothing like you have in the past. Uh, so, um, yeah, so I'm going for one in about a week. <laughs> um, so, uh, I want to know what, uh, what do you expect from that? Are you excited or something? Um, it's a mixture of feelings. So, um, the, the, so the previous Vipassana, the second Vipassana course that I took, <clears throat> um, so, uh, when I, I actually kind of skipped out on a bit, um, the whole thing about Martin Thompson and your ability to observe yourself as a third party observer and the fact that you can't really do that, uh, as your own consciousness, observing your own consciousness. Um, so what I was trying to do in the second Vipassana course that I took was to do that. I was trying to like take a part of my brain and just like move it over here and just like keep watching what's actually going on in my body, in my mind. Um, and what ends up happening if you try to do that is you get very doubtful um, about the course structure, about the meditation itself, and you're kind of rolling in this doubt instead of doing the meditation. Um, the other thing that happens is you don't get to like pick out a piece of your brain and move it over here, really, like, uh, and say, okay, this piece will watch everything else and just see what's going on. It becomes a little bit more like um, single CPU context switching where you're like, I'm meditating, oh my god, I'm thinking, oh, I'm meditating, oh my god, I'm thinking. And so what, that was when I found very distinctly that my sense of hearing was cutting out. Um, so I was noticing that like, if I let myself think, I could hear the birds. Um, in the early morning meditation. And then if I stopped thinking mostly um, and really focused on the meditation in the later days, the birds, I was like, whoa, the birds stopped chirping. It's like, no, the birds didn't stop chirp chirping instantly like that. I started meditating. And then once I have the thought, oh, the birds stopped chir chirping, then I can hear them again. And so it's violently fluctuating between these two things. Um, I will not do any of that on this course if I can all at all avoid it. I would like to follow the instructions like, as closely as possible because um, that 10 days of doubt that I applied to my second course basically told me this seems like a pretty sane thing to do. Um, so I think that um, some of the people that attend the Boston courses make me uncomfortable. Um, so they tend to be 
a little culty, uh, like a little bit weird. Um, yeah, and I realize that's judgmental of me. <laughs> no, but then they also start to believe that I've graduated from one course to the other. So, like, you know, my graduation present made me like good and better. But I mean, there is no thing Yeah, it's quite, there's a, a lot of different, like, sub sections of belief structures. Yeah, so the second time I went to even Korea, I just found it ridiculous that, you know, people thought that they were just getting better and better and it was like this high level of graduation. I was like, I don't think you actually got this. <laughs> So, um, yeah, at, at least in those respects, uh, I, I hope I can just kind of like dive in and do whatever's going on. And if the people around me are bothering me, I'll try to not let them bother me. Um, and in terms of expectation, I really, I have a bunch. And then every time I realize I'm having an expectation about the course, I try to kind of move myself away from it because if there's one thing that I think will always be true for Vipassana, at least I'm guessing, it's that it never turns out the way that you expect. So the first one, I was like, I've done meditation courses before. They're pretty chilled out, and so you just sit around, and you get really relaxed after. I mean, it was not, nothing like I expected, and then the second one was nothing like I expected. So I'm guessing this third one will also be completely unlike uh, the first two, or having the expectation that it'll be completely unlike the first two, maybe it'll be exactly like one of the first two. Who knows? <laughs> um, I do think uh, there is there is an ease to doing it both. so um, when you come away from the course the early morning meditation is much easier right? for the first month or two um, because you've been practicing this thing and it's kind of like basketball or anything else, right? So like, if I'm playing on the basketball team in high school and I get to grade 12 and I graduate, and then the first couple of months in university, my friends are like, let's play basketball. And I'm like, okay, cool, we play basketball, and I'm still kind of okay at it. Um, if someone asked me to play basketball now, over a decade since I graduated from high school, I would be incredibly bad at it because I haven't practiced in a long time. Um, and it is a practice, so I think that that does actually kind of apply. Um, so. I do expect uh, the daily practice to be slightly easier when I come out of the course. Um, and I think that that's a fairly safe assumption. It's hard to say, you know, because it might become harder for me to use this or something. I think the resistance will break strong at some level as well. I think it's more than that. Yeah, I found, um, so some of the resistance that I experience is, uh, there are days where I really, really can't focus for like more than a second, right, on my nose. And so the kind of home practice, um, so like doing it at home, um, the home practice is do Vipassana, but if you can't focus on Vipassana, like if your brain is all over the place and you're thinking about taxis, then do Anapana and calm yourself down and then do Vipassana. And there are a lot of mornings that I wake up and I'm thinking about work and I'm thinking about this person and I'm thinking about this travel that I have to do and I'm thinking about money or whatever human issues I have. And I can't focus at all and I'm just like, I'm worried about this thing, I'm mad, upset at this person, blah, 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 blah. And so I'm just doing Anapana for an hour and 45 minutes into that, you're like, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> like you're just going to stand up and go have a shower and get to work 15 minutes earlier. Um, and so I think that doing the courses does kind of move you away from that sort of meditation a little bit. So uh, one thing I, I, I was crossing my mind is that uh, there is a distinction between control and um, like deprivation, like sensory deprivation is a sensory control. And uh, it's like control is like one step above Deprivation, like deprivation is one kind of control where you just like um, control is like having control through what way you want to do. So, is any part of vipassana uh, having like does any part of vipassana have to do with control over the sense other than self or whatever thing you have here? Um, not really. So if you read about, so like as far as the Vipassana course is concerned, um, it's basically like narrow down on the spot, move it around, um, and just keep doing that. 
right? And so the instruction goes so far as to say, if you have completely dissolved your body where you just don't feel like there's a body anymore, which would be the like, I'm not sure who I am state that the neuroscientists refer to, and supposedly that's what it feels like. Like it's very scary to cross, like lots of people have done this, this is really not, it's not like a fancy thing, um, especially monks. So if you speak to monks or people who've been through this experience, they're like, the first time that you dissolve your whole body uh, mentally, you have this really scary moment where you're not sure if you could like, should go this last mile of just observing yourself and then you do it and then it feels like this the concept of oneness often comes up there or whatever. Um, but the instruction at that point is just, okay, now just keep doing it, right? Like if part of your body re-emerges, like your finger's back, then just look at your finger until it goes away. So that meditation is basically like, just keep doing this thing where you're like really calm, with everything that you're feeling internally. Um, and then I read a couple of things of Goenka describing like his instruction uh, when he was in Burma, um, where it's like, oh, okay, you've completely dissolved your body and you don't really feel it, you just feel like vibrating or whatever. Um, and now you're going to stop meditating and you're gonna to try to feel that while you're like awake and conscious. Right? So you maintain this state and you walk around and you eat food and you like, do normal things while maintaining this. Um, and in, I guess at that point, Vipassana, as like an instruction, would say, now kind of apply this to other sensory input, right? But it's not really, I don't think that's about control. So you're saying, <clears throat> when you're saying control, this seventh sense or the sixth sense of like internal feeling, um, it's not exactly control because you're just trying to watch without doing anything, right? It's kind of the opposite of control. So you're like controlling where your attention is, but that's it. Um, and then to let your other senses in, I imagine, I have no idea and I probably will never know, um, is just to like let your senses come in and be like, oh, okay, food feels like this, or like I'm seeing blah, I'm just like completely okay with it. I don't get uh, upset one way or the other. Like I don't get passionate and I don't get um, angry or depressed or whatever. But, um, that's like you don't read much about that um, and it doesn't talk about it in the course really so I'm guessing uh, that's something that you probably have to experience to become a teacher of the class but I'm not even sure. Thanks everybody.